to talk a little bit about your journey with pudendal neuralgia and how and why you became interested in this diagnosis and how you learned to treat this diagnosis. Sure. Well, uh, it all started after a patient of mine developed pudendal neuralgia after a prolapse uh, surgery that I did on her. This is probably 16 years ago. And I learned what I could about it, uh, did what I could to try to help her, and her symptoms unfortunately continued to be uh, quite significant. Uh, so I said, okay, well, I'm only 35 miles north of the medical mecca of Boston. Assuredly, someone at one of the Harvard-affiliated uh, hospitals would be able to treat my patients. So I started a series of referrals down to the Boston area, only to discover that, indeed, no one really treats pudendal neuralgia in mm -hmm. Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, so that led to further research uh, and uh, contacting uh, various experts uh, around the world. Um, and my patient elected to undergo a corrective surgery in France. Mm -hmm. And uh, she asked if I wouldn't accompany her so I could learn more about this and treat other patients. Uh, she was uh, very interested in trying to treat this uh, uh, unfortunate uh, uh, diagnosis that she had uh, gotten to try to get me to help other people so they wouldn't have to travel to Europe to have treatment. Mm -hmm. And uh, my hospital was very supportive, and so that was my first trip to France to work with Eric Bertrand in uh, Aix-en-Provence. Um, and I actually assisted on my patient's surgery as well as in several other surgeries, and that led to a second trip uh, a few months later to do more surgeries there with him. And then I started uh, doing the surgery and treating patients here uh, in New Hampshire. So what was the technique that you uh, learned with uh, Dr. Bertrand? So the technique that Dr. Bertrand performed was the so-called TIR uh, technique, which in a woman would be a, an incision in the vagina in order to gain access to the space between the two, these two ligaments in the pelvis called the sacrospinous and sacros, uh, tuberous ligament. Mm -hmm. It would involve uh, sectioning at least a portion of the sacrospinous ligament and then just doing blunt dissection uh, between the two ligaments to try to free the nerve up that way. Mm -hmm. Why don't you show, actually, let me see. So go ahead and point where you, um, the, the two ligaments that you were just referring to. So this is the sacro tuberous ligament, mm -hmm. and underlying it is the sacrospinous ligament. On this side, you can see the sacrospinous ligament because the sacro tuberous ligament's not there. So the nerve passes between the two in this area uh -huh. here. So from the vaginal approach, we would cut the sacrospinous ligament here. I can show it better here. We cut the ligament here. Mm -hmm and then just bluntly dissect between the two and try to get down to this area here, which is called Alcox Canal, which is down this area here, to open that a little bit as well. It also involved intraoperative EMG testing to mm -hmm. see if we can improve nerve uh, conduction. Um, and that was a technique I used for several years. I did hundreds of uh, cases. And you no longer use that technique? Correct. Um, there's another kind of classic technique called the transgluteal technique, which was invented by Dr. Robert in uh, Nantes in France. Mm -hmm. And his technique was to make an incision on the buttock. So imagine a, you know, a buttock here, mm -hmm. and you make an incision like this, uh, and he would cut the sacrotuberous ligament like this, and then cut the sacrospinous ligament as well mm -hmm. in order to create a lot of space around the nerve. Mm -hmm. And then he would open Alcott's canal as well with mm -hmm. scissors. Um, we never liked that technique because the concept of losing, you know, both ligaments, we were concerned about pelvic stability, mm -hmm. especially if the patient has the procedure done bilaterally, then they would have all four ligaments cut. Mm -hmm. um, so some of my colleagues here in the United States, uh, namely Stanley Antelok, uh, came up with a modification where rather than cut through the ligament this way, the fibers run longitudinally like this. Mm -hmm. So we could split, make a little slit in the ligament and spread it. Okay. And, and thus, we would preserve probably 95% of the ligament. Mm -hmm. It still gives us enough room to then identify the pudendal nerve very carefully, uh, free it from any fibrosis, et cetera, mm -hmm. and then cut the sacrospinous ligament. All of the nerve decompression surgeries sacrifice the sacrospinous ligament, no matter the technique. And what is the consequence of that? We feel very little loss of pelvic stability because the sacrotuberous ligament is much larger. Uh -huh. 
Also, in adults, the uh, sacral iliac joint is much stronger. Uh, it's thought that these ligaments are more important for pelvic stability in, in children and, and young adults, mm -hmm. um, but we still feel it's very important to preserve the sacral tubus ligament. So now you use the transgluteal approach only? Correct. Um, and this was really born out of the fact that uh, I had several patients who did not respond to the TIR technique. Uh -huh. So then when I went and did the transgluteal technique on them, we always found a remnant of the sacrospinous ligament was there, uh, and that's where the nerve was uh, entrapped again. Uh -huh. So it's very difficult to get through the entire sacrospinous ligament through that TIR technique. Uh -huh. Plus, it's kind of hard to describe, but it's also more difficult and more dangerous because you can get into more bleeding uh, than with the uh, transgluteal technique. So when did you start using the transgluteal approach versus the TIR approach? For, for a while, I gave patients a choice uh, mm -hmm. between the two, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because they'd never been compared to one another in a scientific trial. Mm -hmm. But just my own clinical experience, I just gradually started to say, you know, I think the transgluteal is better. I was probably one of the few people in the world that had an extensive experience using two different techniques. Mm -hmm. Most surgeons kind of just use one, mm -hmm. the, usually the first one they were trained on. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in my experience, it's a transgluteal is better. And I probably switched over eight, eight years ago, eight, nine years ago, something like that. Great. And you treat both men and women, is that correct? I do. Okay. And how does that work, a gynecologist treating men? <laughs> so the problem, the issue is for male patients is that access to caregivers is even worse than it is for women. Mm. Uh, to my knowledge, I'm one of the only uh, um, you know, physicians who do this surgery who treat men and also who takes insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, so most of my male patients have very little qualms with coming to my office to see me. They're in a lot of pain, and they just want someone to help them. Right. So let's talk about treating pudendal neuralgia in general before we get to uh, the decompression approach. So when a patient, um, when you see a patient for consult that has... Uh, suspected PN or symptoms of PN, uh, what is your uh, process in recommending treatment for those symptoms? Well, first of all, obviously, we have to confirm the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you do that? The diagnosis is primarily clinical. Okay. Um, so history, you know, patients' pain complaints are consistent with pudendal neuralgia. Mm -hmm. In general, the pain's in the distribution of the pudendal nerve, mm -hmm. at least one of the branches. Uh, and, and that distribution is roughly? So, you know, in the genital area, uh -huh. all the way from the penis, anal clitoris, to the perianal, anal rectal area. Okay. So, uh, so assuming the patient's history is consistent with it, then we move on to physical examination. Mm -hmm. uh, patients will often have uh, abnormally sensitive skin, uh, so a light touch is painful, uh, or sometimes in more severe cases, they'll have numbness. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also, you know, evidence of uh, pelvic floor muscle dysfunction, hypertonus of the pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, uh, what, I, what I really focus on for, for my part is to check for nerve hypersensitivity to compression. Mm -hmm. And that's generally done through the rectal examination, compressing mm -hmm. the pudendal nerve either between the two ligaments mm -hmm. or along the course of the Alcox Canal. Mm -hmm. If this mimics the patient's pain and flares their pain after the exam, that's one of the most uh, significant parts of the physical examination. Okay. How else can you definitively diagnose pudendal neuralgia? Is there an imaging technique um, or is there some other sort of diagnostic uh, diagnostics to do this? We were one of the only centers in the country that did EMG testing of the pudendal nerve, mm -hmm. uh, which we learned in France. Mm -hmm. and we did that for many years. Um, however, we found that it added little to the clinical picture. Mm -hmm. uh, the EMG almost always, like 98% of the time, agreed with our clinical assessment uh -huh. and was quite uncomfortable for the patients, so we didn't really feel that that was much value, so we stopped doing that. Okay. Uh, imaging has always been an area that's been interesting to people. Uh, it's very tempting to, to think that we could get a special image of the area and say, aha, this is exactly where the problem is and diagnose it. Mm -hmm. The most interesting one is the high-resolution MRI, the so-called 3T mm -hmm. MRI. Um, I've done extensive amounts of these imaging uh, images uh, with various uh, centers around the country, and we really just don't know how useful it is. There's been no real published data on its uh, accuracy, mm -hmm. and 
I just don't really think it plays a major role, uh, and I don't really order a lot of them anymore. Okay. Uh, ultrasound has been another one that's been interesting. Uh, it's been used in Europe uh, primarily. I don't know of any real centers in the U.S. doing it, but essentially you can measure blood flow in the pudendal artery. So mm -hmm. always remember the pudendal artery accompanies the nerve on this, on this journey. Mm -hmm. And you can see some disturbances in blood flow, in particular between the two ligaments, between the sacrospinous mm -hmm. and sacrotuberous ligament. And you mm -hmm. can use that as a marker for nerve compression. Mm -hmm. And uh, it appears to actually be fairly accurate, but again, not widely available in the United States. Okay. So a physical exam, you feel, is sufficient to diagnose, but with the history, a physical exam um, is sufficient to diagnose pudendal neuralgia? Yes. Okay. Um, how do pudendal nerve blocks play a role, or do they play a role in diagnosis of pudendal neuralgia? Yeah, many uh, people do consider them a uh, part of the diagnostic criteria. Uh -huh. The patient needs to have at least temporary pain relief from a pudendal nerve block. Okay. okay. So uh, let's get into treatment. Um, so you have definitively or diagnosed this person with pudendal neuralgia. What are your recommendations as far as treatment? So number one, we talk about pudendal protection, mm -hmm. uh, avoiding activities that make the pain worse. If sitting is a major component of the patient's pain, they should try to limit sitting as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Or use an accommodating seating cushion that you can even buy commercially. I often talk to my patients about how to fabricate their own. Mm -hmm. uh, because the key uh, measurement with a, a seating cushion is the distance between these two areas. This is called the ischial tuberosity. Uh -huh. Lay people call it the sits bone. Mm -hmm. The distance from here to here is going to vary a little bit from every person, uh, as well as the amount of tissue on top of it is going to vary. So a cookie cutter uh, cushion, you know, for, may not fit a lot of uh, a lot of people because that cushion has to rest right on this area here mm -hmm. and here. Mm -hmm. If it's anywhere in here, it could still pinch the nerve. Mm -hmm. If it's out here, then people start to fall into the cushion. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's why I talked to a lot of my patients about uh, making their own. Mm -hmm. I am aware that many of the companies now, or at least a couple of the companies, have the ability for you to modify your product mm -hmm. to try to fit you better. Right. Good. So that's, uh, that's my first thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and for some patients, just not annoying the nerve uh, really will see their symptoms go down, but it may take months for that to really happen. Mm -hmm. uh, medical pain management with you know, pudendal nerve blocks, either diagnostically, some patients respond better than that. I've had patients who get a pudendal nerve block done and their pain relief may last weeks or months. Mm -hmm. The composition of the nerve block is an area of controversy. Mm -hmm. uh, I go with the recommendations from the group in France who invented the pudendal nerve block technology. Mm -hmm. They published a paper in, in a British journal two, two or three years ago showing that steroids are not effective uh -huh. and should not be used. They simply use long-acting um, local anesthetic. Mm -hmm. The concept as to why that actually helps for durations much longer than the anesthetic itself, it's thought that it's kind of resetting or rebooting the nerve, mm -hmm. so the nerve is less sensitive or less hypersensitive after the block, even after the medication is worn off. So there's not a need, an anti-inflammatory reason to include a steroid within that nerve block. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And is it possible that the steroid could have a negative effect on the nerve? Absolutely. A couple of different steroids do uh, precipitate out into almost small crystals or a soapy mm -hmm. type of material mm -hmm. that could actually further irritate the nerve. Uh -huh. So how um, it has been our experience in practice that many of our pain uh, physician colleagues uh, prefer to use a steroid with an anesthetic. Um, what advice would you have to give to a patient to uh, have a conversation with their with their pain doc about um, excluding a steroid? <clears throat> it's a struggle. Uh, my my pain colleagues, uh, you know, are addicted to steroids. Uh, you know, essentially, uh, it's a conversation. So the patient needs to have a conversation with them. I'm more than happy to have a conversation with them as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, sometimes it, it is difficult to get them off that steroid because they really feel, and you know, rightly, you know, to defend their point of view, they feel it's the best thing for the patient and they mm -hmm. don't want to put them through a procedure that they don't think will be effective. Mm -hmm. um, just that the science doesn't support it. Right. So what other uh, treatment strategies are there for pudendal neuralgia other than um, pudendal production, which you mentioned, 
and possibly pudendal nerve blocks. What else? So medication, mm -hmm. there's a whole host of different medications that can be used to try to reduce nerve hypersensitivity. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's nothing magical about the pudendal nerve versus any other nerve, any other neuralgia someone would have. Uh, let's say a, a trigeminal neuralgia in the face. You would treat it the same way with medication as you would the pudendal nerve. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, there's really no rhyme or reason to it. Uh, there's a list of them, and the pain doc just works the list. Mm -hmm. Tries a medication, let's say gabapentin, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the patient can't tolerate it or it's not effective, then you move on to the next medication, mm -hmm. like pregabalin. Mm -hmm. Try that one. If that doesn't work, move on to the next medication. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you find something that uh, you know helps reduce symptoms and is well tolerated, uh, then you stick with it. Mm -hmm. And are medications, uh, do you prescribe these medications for your patients or do you recommend that they see a pain specialist? Uh, I recommend a pain specialist. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to try to work with that pain specialist just to coordinate care, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I would not be the prescribing physician. Okay. Um, what about other interventions? Physical therapy. Ah. Yes, uh, it's a cornerstone of treatment. Mm -hmm. So this gets into one of the typical areas that we are always struggling with in pudendal neuralgia, right? Is the pelvic floor muscle dysfunction, is that the primary problem? And the nerve is just being dragged along because of the uh, traction from the pelvic floor muscle dysfunction causing neural tension and pain? Mm -hmm. uh, or is the nerve the primary problem causing knock-on effect of pelvic floor muscle dysfunction? Mm -hmm. The two are so tightly intertwined I think for most of the time, it's kind of a fool's errand to try to untie that. We just end up having to treat both components. Mm -hmm. So we treat the nerve with the things we just discussed, and mm -hmm. we treat the muscle with physical therapy. Sometimes if the therapist says to me, you know, I work on these muscles and they're, they're better for a day or two, but then they just go right back to where they were before and the patient's symptomatic again, that's when Botox to the pelvic floor mm -hmm. might be uh, a useful treatment. Mm -hmm coupled with continued physical therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, so as the pelvic floor muscle tone returns over several weeks, hopefully it won't get back to that hypertonic state if, if physical therapies continue during that time. Yeah, this really highlights the importance of that multidisciplinary treatment team, right, for these patients with PM, because as you mentioned, as we find very often, uh, you don't necessarily know what the primary <clears throat> contributor to the pain is and what came first whether it was the nerve or the muscles, or so you have to treat everything uh, at the same time, essentially, and with various different uh, interventions. So talking about Botox a little bit, um, so do you do Botox injections? I don't. You don't. And so who primarily does those? I mean, so, you know, this, this area is just a hodgepodge of specialties. Mm -hmm. uh, some urologists, some uh, GYN urologists will mm -hmm. uh, do Botox. Mm -hmm. Uh, those are generally the two specialties that do that the most. I see. What about some of the other interventions that are available for treating pudendal neuralgia? For example, pulse radio frequency. Um, what's your experience with uh, that intervention? So there's been essentially one study uh, mm -hmm. uh, done in Italy uh, you know, two or three years ago now, maybe even more. Uh, had one year of follow-up that showed uh, good results. Mm -hmm. uh, so we became very interested. I had a couple of colleagues of mine uh, around the country uh, do quite a number of these mm -hmm. uh, with less, uh, less good results. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not one of our first-line treatments at this time. Is that something that you present as an option to patients, though, that they should explore? They can consider it, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Any other interventions, for example, um, uh, like a neuromodulator or some sort of spinal stimulator? Well, before we do that, though, there's another ablation technology, cryoablation. Cryoablation, yeah. Uh, so pulse radio frequency heats up the nerve, mm -hmm. cryoablation kind of freezes it. Mm -hmm. uh, it definitely, in, in my clinical opinion, is more effective than uh, the okay. pulse radio frequency because it doesn't have to be as precise. Uh -huh. It's easier to get an effect on the nerve. Mm -hmm. uh, patients often will find the nerve to be very hypo-functional, very low-function afterwards. Patients may have to deal with some transient incontinence and uh -huh. whatnot. Okay. But many of them actually will note some pain relief, uh, and those functions will return. Okay. Um, it's only offered by a couple places in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we don't have any long-term data on it, uh, but it appears to be pretty safe. Mm -hmm. uh, so it certainly could be uh, another considered treatment. Okay. Uh, with regard to neuromodulation, mm -hmm. there are uh, two 
separate competing uh, kind of technologies. There's a technique for putting a nerve stimulator directly on the pudendal nerve. Mm -hmm. uh, again, only offered by a couple of practitioners in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have any big data sets on that. Uh, appears to be safe and for some people effective. Mm -hmm. Uh, especially if they also have urinary symptoms like urgency and frequency, that technology seems to be helpful. Okay. Uh, with regard to spinal uh, neuromodulation, there's a couple different technologies. There's the so-called dorsal column technology, which is the traditional spinal cord stimulator. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of problems with lead migration and leak leak over into other areas mm -hmm. uh, that was kind of limited that uh, that technique. So lead migration meaning the wires essentially move to correct. to the incorrect pl place. Correct, and then, and then that's just not effective. Makes sense. Um, so the newest technology is called the DRG stimulator from mm -hmm. the dorsal root ganglion mm -hmm. stimulator, and those uh, leads are placed actually into the opening, the foramen on the side of the uh, uh, discs. Mm. Uh, and it's a much more stable lead placement, less likely to migrate. Uh -huh. And it's also more specific because the dorsal root ganglion, which is where the stimulator uh, is placed, is in particular involved in pain signal transmission. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that you'll kind of scramble those pain signals on the way up to the brain so the patients get pain relief. I see. And have you had a number of patients have the DRG stimulator placed? Yes. And what is their general you know, response been? Mixed. Mixed. <laughs> so I definitely had some patients who got some benefit from it mm -hmm. and other patients not. It's a technically kind of challenging placement, mm -hmm. especially for the sacral uh, segment leads. Mm -hmm. So you really want to go to someone who's done quite a number of them. You mm -hmm. don't want to be like the first one that they tried. And correct me if I'm wrong, but this is a fairly new technology in this country. Correct. Yes. And so there are not an abundance of clinicians that are doing it, let alone have, you know, pretty big or vast experience with this technology, right? Just as everything in pudendal neuralgia, it's not available uh, on every in every community. Uh, so many patients will have to travel to uh, find a specialist who's uh, experienced. Right, right. The challenges of pudendal neuralgia. So, um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but when you are treating a patient with pudendal neuralgia, you start with the most conservative uh, treatment, protection, PT, medications, and then if those things are not uh, effective enough um, and, the pain, and the pain is persisting, then you move on to possibly pulse radio frequency or cryoablation or, or well, what's the next step, I suppose, after that? Is it uh, neuromodulation or do you, when and if, do you consider uh, surgical decompression? So again, these technologies have never been compared to one another mm -hmm. in, in a scientific fashion. Uh, so really the decision as to how you order the treatments is a personal one. Mm -hmm. uh, so some patients will choose to do all of the less invasive, more conservative treatments first mm -hmm. and save nerve decompression uh, for the, you know, I want to say last resort, but one of the, the final uh, areas of treatment. Sure. And other patients will not. They'll order it a different way. My own personal philosophy, and I fully admit that this is a philosophy, it's not based on uh, scientific research, mm. is that I feel those other technologies, the DRG stimulators, the pudendal nerve stimulator, or the ablation procedures should be reserved for patients who fail surgery. Okay. Surgery has at least the potential to try to treat the underlying cause and return the nerve to normal function or at least better function. Versus these other technologies do nothing for that. They okay. simply are trying to reduce pain, mm -hmm. which is a great goal. But, mm -hmm. you know, if you could actually try to return to more normal neural function, I feel that's a better solution. Right. And also possibly much more durable. Uh -huh. uh, you know, to have a 30-year-old patient, you know, dependent on a, on a neuromodulating device for the rest of their life. Uh, you know, is difficult because it's going to break. It's going to have to be replaced. You know, components are going to have to be replaced. Right. It requires constant maintenance. Right. So are there, when you're at the point where you're considering, the patient is considering possibly a decompression procedure, are there certain signs or red flags, if you will, of when you should move towards a decompression sooner rather than later? Yes. Uh, in particular, signs of Neuropathy. Okay. So neuralgia is pain mediated by a nerve. Neuropathy is actually dysfunction, end organ dysfunction. Okay. 
So my patients that come to me with a lot of numbness, uh -huh. uh, numbness with erectile dysfunction in men, uh, or numbness associated with incontinence, mm -hmm. especially if it's getting worse, mm -hmm. that's a sign of the nerve really being under duress. Uh -huh. And that's one of the few times when I talk to patients that maybe we should think about surgery sooner rather than later. Right. And just to clarify, numbness is different than altered sensation or pins and needles or hypersensitivity. This is actually you cannot feel when you're being touched in the area that, or the distribution of the nerve, correct? Yes. Okay. In, I think, in particular, I mean, some of these areas have a really high nerve density. Right. <laughs> They're supposed to be pretty sensitive. Right. It's always very remarkable to me when uh, I'm using a sharp pinprick on someone's genitals and they cannot feel it. Right. I think it's an important point to, to make. It's, a, I think, a, often a point of confusion with patients with, you know, whether it's, it feels different or weird or painful versus I can't feel at all. Right. Okay. So in those scenarios, you're moving to surgery likely sooner than later because you want to try to relieve that compression on the nerve to because it's affecting now the motor dysfunction, right? right? And just to explain how um, when nerves are compressed, the outer part of the nerve is the sensory component, yes, and the inside is the motor. So when the nerve, the more it's compressed, then it will affect the motor function, correct? Yeah. Once you're getting to motor function, that's a real sign of, of significant potential damage to the nerve, right. especially because the motor neurons are actually insulated with myelin uh -huh. versus the sensory ones are not. Uh -huh. So the sensory ones are more easily injured, uh -huh. um, but the mo if you're really getting motor, then you know the whole nerve is really in peril. Uh -huh. And so with the neuralgia, is the nerve damaged beyond repair or can it recover? Uh, it could be damaged beyond repair, but I think the majority of the time it could recover. Okay, good. I think it's also a good point to make. So let's say um, in you, the patient is not feel, having any motor loss, meaning incontinence or erectile dysfunction or numbness, but they, their symptoms are progressing, uh, more pain, the intervention, more conservative interventions have not been effective. So you're having the, the conversation about surgery. So how is... How do you and the patient uh, essentially come to that, you know, that decision? What are some of the, um, the things that may help folks uh, try to understand when that decision should be made or how to make that decision, things to consider, that type of thing? Well, obviously, there's a lot of variation from patient to patient with yeah. regard to their story. You know, sure. a patient with pain for six months versus a patient with pain for 10 years. Mm -hmm. You know, those conversations are going to be different. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, you know, I, I try to lay it out as simply as possible. I said, look, you've, you've tried, you know, all of the uh, appropriate conservative interventions and mm -hmm. their symptoms either haven't changed at all or they've gotten worse mm -hmm. or they just haven't gotten better enough mm -hmm. to return you to the level of function that you really want to retreat. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's when I think we should talk about the next step in treatment, which would be the surgery. Right. So when you, if you've come to that conclusion with the patient, or the patient has come to that decision to have the surgery, what, uh, how do you describe the surgery to the patient, what they should expect as far as, as, far as their post-op care, uh, their rehabilitation, possible treatment afterwards? Like, how does that conversation go? I always tell, say to everyone, don't think of surgery as being the end of your treatment. Mm -hmm. Think of it kind of as a middle step. Uh -huh. Oftentimes, we have to repeat many of the therapies afterwards, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be medication, neuroflox, or physical therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's so interesting, uh, you know, uh, so many stories over the years of people told me, you know, I did physical therapy for two years, and it really never helped me. Mm -hmm. I had the surgery, and it was you know, three or four months out from surgery. I was very discouraged because I felt the same. Mm -hmm. I said, well, let's give physical therapy another try. Mm -hmm. And they and they're going to it very you know, skeptically. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, you know, uh, 12, 14 weeks after that, they're seeing some significant symptom relief that's much more durable than they had in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the big key for patients is to be patient mm -hmm. about their recovery. Nerves heal at a slow rate. Mm -hmm. uh, they are very finicky. Uh, some patients will see improvement relatively quickly after just a couple months, but that's a real minority. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of people may not see any improvement even six months, a year out from surgery. Mm -hmm. We talk to people to really think about a two-year horizon for nerve uh, improvement. Mm -hmm. But we've even seen patients in year three or year four see continued improvement. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the big thing. They just 
just don't think I'm going to have the surgery and six weeks later I'm going to be great because mm -hmm. that's really rare that that happens. Most people right. take much longer. Right. Patience is definitely a key understanding for this process. So immediately post-operatively, uh, what are what would a patient expect as far as recovery, uh, sitting ability, you know, just the logistics of it? How long do I need to take off work? How, how long before I can take care of my kids? That type of thing. Yeah, boy, I tell you, that's always a really tough tough one, it really, but it really depends on how bad the patient's preoperative pain is. Okay. So if you have a patient who's really quite debilitated preoperatively, mm -hmm. uh, then obviously it's going to be much longer for them. If uh -huh. someone's symptoms are, you know, really confined to just sitting, otherwise they really function pretty well, you mm -hmm. know, type thing, then I'd say, well, you're going to do little to no sitting for about six weeks. Mm -hmm. Uh, then after that, increase as tolerated. Okay. As long as it does not cause a big flare-up of your pudendal nerve pain, uh, then you can do that activity. Okay. Um, immediately postoperatively, uh, again, most of my patients have an epidural for postoperative pain control. Uh, uh, and it's always so fascinating how many patients, because, you know, when you describe the surgery to them, you know, going through all that muscle, the gluteus muscle, it sounds like, my gosh, it's going to be so painful afterwards. Uh, so many of my patients tell me, compared to their nerve pain, their surgical pain is not that uh, that terrible. Plus, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, surgical pain is generally well treated with medication, mm -hmm. versus a uh, nerve pain is not. Right. Um, so, uh, so really, patients tolerate the procedure pretty well. Okay. Um, and they're in the hospital for a couple of days. One to two days. One to two days. Okay. Again, depending on their degree of uh, debilitation prior to. Uh -huh. Especially for the patients who are highly narcotic dependent, uh -huh. um, their hospital stay is often longer because it, it's just much more difficult to manage their pain postoperatively, right. which is why it's optimal to have patients on no narcotics prior to surgery. <coughs> right. And uh, you see people that come visit you from all over the United States and, and the world, is that right? That's correct. And so how long do they typically stay here? I usually tell people you know, that they're here probably for a total of about 10 days, okay. sometimes a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Um, and let's talk about when you're actually doing the surgical procedure itself. What are some of the various findings when you, um, when you, you know, open up the patient and you find the nerve? What are some variations of, of entrapment that you find? So there's a, a couple of interesting things that we definitely are seeing trends. Uh, uh, we know from cadaver studies about 10% of the population is walking around with a pudendal nerve entrapment. Mm -hmm. Thank God the vast majority of them are asymptomatic. Uh, so we often find, especially in patients who don't have a really good story for how it came about, it mm -hmm. just kind of happened, mm -hmm. um, we find that they have congenital entrapments. Mm -hmm. So they were born with that entrapment. Correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, only after many, many years did it decide to become symptomatic. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, yeah, so patients may have a significant anatomic predisposition to this condition. Mm -hmm. And what are some of those... Uh, uh, anatomic anomalies that uh, are a congenital entrapment? The most common one we find is a very large, what we call, falciform process. So that's kind of this area here of the, of the ligaments, kind of forms the opening or the start of uh, Alcock's canal. Um, so that this is much larger than normal and kind of folds back almost at a right angle uh, to the edge of the ligament and fuses with the underlying sacred uh, spinous ligament so that there is absolutely this tiny little spot that the nerve and the blood vessels is going through, usually right near this bony structure called the ischial spine. Mm -hmm. um, and so we find that very frequently. Mm -hmm. The other finding we uh, find as far as congenital uh, anomaly is the nerve actually not going uh, on top of the sacrospinous ligament like it should here, but actually piercing and actually going right through the ligament uh, entrapping the nerve at that level. Mm -hmm. Those are the two most common um, congenital entrapments we see. How about Nalcox Canal as another source of entrapment or site of entrapment? So I think that's much less likely to be um, uh, congenital. I think that's more likely uh, secondary to trauma to the area, uh -huh. uh, you know, from cyclists, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's where, and it's usually the top third of the canal mm -hmm. where you'll see the fibrosis where the nerve is really tethered mm -hmm. down. Is there any way to diagnose entrapment? So again, you stumbled into one of my pet peeves. Uh, pudendal nerve entrapment, I think, is a kind of a useless term mm -hmm. uh, because we know tons of people have it mm -hmm. and don't have symptoms. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, I just tell my patients, look, we don't worry about if you entrapped or not entrapped prior to surgery. We say, look, you haven't responded to treatment, so whatever we're doing isn't enough, and we have to do something to try to free up that nerve so mm -hmm. it will heal, regenerate, and hopefully improve the function. Mm -hmm. We oftentimes do find entrapment, mm -hmm. or almost all the time, mm -hmm. um, because we're really pretty conservative about who we operate on. Mm -hmm. I operate on a fraction of the patients I see. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings up how... How many cases do you think you have, have done? In total or just the transgluteal? Just the transgluteal, let's say. I don't know, 400, three or 400? Okay, so in, in, the, in the number of PN patients that you have seen are in the- Thousands. Thousands, okay. So a, a small fraction of yeah. those that you've seen. Um, so just to reiterate, because this is a question that comes up very, very often, there is no definitive way to diagnose pedental nerve entrapment. Correct. Except when you do a decompression procedure and yes. you actually can visualize the entrapment. Right. Okay. So that is, an, you know, patients are always concerned about that. Yeah. That they say, what if it looks normal? You know, uh, I can say uh, that I, it's never really happened to me. Mm -hmm. uh, what has also been very interesting is when the patients had the bilateral surgery. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they've got symptoms on both sides, mm -hmm. but one side is, is significantly worse than the other mm -hmm. symptomatically, mm -hmm. you know, uh, say 70-30, like, you know, 70% one side, 30% the other side. Mm -hmm. At surgery, the anatomic appearance of the nerve and everything mirrors those findings mm -hmm. virtually 100% of the time. Interesting. So the worst side looks worse mm -hmm. and the better side looks better. Mm -hmm. um, but I've never operated on someone that said, wow, that's just a perfectly normal uh, situation there. And so what does the nerve look like when it is compressed versus a normal healthy nerve? Can you see a difference in the nerve? Oftentimes, yes, you can actually see it's dented and it's actually flattened. Uh -huh. uh, and after it's decompressed, you can see it sort of to return to a more normal round shape. Uh -huh. Interesting. So, um, for the patients that have experienced motor loss, incontinence, erectile dysfunction, or numbness, can they expect to regain function after a decompression procedure? Obviously, the hope is that they'll regain function, mm -hmm. but they have most likely a less good outcome, in particular the numb patients. Uh -huh. Erectile dysfunction is an interesting one because there's two components to erectile dysfunction. One is the nerve the nerve dysfunction, but it's also the compression of the pudendal artery, inhibiting uh -huh. blood flow. Right. So many, many of my male patients have uh, seen a pretty uh, robust uh, return of erectile function. I see. Um, so for the, this is, a, I know, a very difficult slash impossible question to answer, but patients will always ask about outcomes. You know, how many, what's the percentage of patients that get better? that have partial resolution, complete resolution. Um, and I know, you know, there is not, there aren't many studies that have really looked at this, but what is your clinical experience? Or what do you tell people? So I tell people that I don't know my outcomes mm -hmm. uh, because to, to actually measure that is extremely time consuming and rigorous. I'm not a, a, you know, a clinical scientist, I'm a clinician. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I am in contact with many of the people who have done research on this area. Mm -hmm. And in general, most people would say the numbers shake out about 40 to 50% of patients will see a profound improvement. Now, okay. whether that means completely cured, like they never ever have another symptom, mm -hmm. I think getting to that level is, uh, is very ambitious. Mm -hmm. I think most people might still have some lingering um, symptoms here and there, but they're functioning at a very high level yeah. and very pleased with their outcome. Uh -huh. uh, another 20 to 30% will see a moderate improvement. Now, that's also interesting too. If, but if, let's say you have someone who's eight or ten, eight to ten on the pain scale half the time, mm -hmm. type thing, and you get them down to four to five. Mm -hmm. Actually, for a lot of those patients, that's a real game changer for them. Mm -hmm. They go to a much higher level of function, mm -hmm. uh, and and they'll also be pretty pleased with their outcome. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, at least twenty percent of patients don't seem to respond to surgery. Mm -hmm. And for those folks who don't respond to surgery, what's the recommendation as far as treatment? So again, that's when we would go back to those other treatments, the ablations, the nerve modulators, those types of things. I see. Okay. Um, and besides yourself, um, how uh, available is the surgical decompression in this country? 
Not very. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, maybe there's five or six people doing it, something like that. Right. Um, as I said, many of them, uh, some of them don't treat men, mm -hmm. uh, and some of them are a little bit more expensive because they're in private practice where they don't take insurance. I see. And so say someone from, or any a patient would like to consult with you about their symptoms, how do they go about uh, scheduling a, do you do phone consultations or now telehealth? Um, or in-person evaluations? Uh, I do. We do telehealth now. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we encourage pretty much all the patients, unless they're really local, like from you know southern New Hampshire, to mm -hmm. do a, a telehealth visit first. I see. Uh, and then if uh, the patient feels it sounds feels appropriate and I feel it's appropriate, then they can schedule an in-office uh, consultation. Mm -hmm. okay. So for... Um, those that are suffering with pudendal neuralgia or think that they're suffering from pudendal neuralgia, what would be um, some overall advice as far as seeking the right clinician, seeking the right treatment, uh, maybe combination, and um, maybe uh, some, some words of hope for those folks? Well, I, I think the, the big take home message is that the significant majority of patients are at least going to see a moderate amount of improvement with treatment. Okay. And many patients see really, really good recoveries. Okay. And so they should absolutely be hopeful that they'll, they'll have a, a significant improvement in their quality of life. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, advice as far as trying to find the right clinician, I mean, that, that's, really, that's really difficult. Uh, just because, again, the for the whole comprehensive treatment uh, arm of things, there just are very few places nationally. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, do your research. You know, uh, uh, see you know, uh, see what the, their reputations are as best we can. Almost all of us have extensive uh, reviews online, etc. cetera. Uh, and and also, you know, uh, you know, when you meet with the person, whether it be telehealth or in person, um, you know, try to gauge your reaction to them, you know, you know in that setting as well. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to tell a patient, who are, the, or I, who are the most important people that should be on their treatment team, the different kinds of clinicians? Well, I'm not going to play favorites with any of, any of those. I think they're all played in right, right. So who is, important roles. So who is the most important on the team? Not saying that there's one more important than the other, but uh, for a patient who is just you know, coming to the conclusion that they probably have penal neuralgia, who should they look for to be on their team? Well, I mean, a pain management person okay. to manage your medication and possibly do pedal nerve blocks right. and qualified physical therapist. Right. Probably the two, the two, you know, cornerstones of the conservative uh, batch of treatment. Great. One other thing we really haven't talked about is the mental health uh -huh. aspects of uh, yep. of this pain. Yep. Uh, it's been very well studied now that genital pain causes more mental anxiety and and, and strife uh, uh, for patients than let's say foot pain does. Right. Um, and so that's a really important component that patients get the appropriate uh, psychological or psychiatric help and support uh, because it will help them uh, get through this pain journey better. Right. I'm glad you brought that up. So a uh, qualified pain physician, a physical therapist, a mental health specialist of some sort, and then depending on whether you're male or female or maybe um, it doesn't matter with you, a gynecologist or a urologist to, um, to hopefully help in that rule out anything else or um, um, specifically for male and female. What about the role of a primary care physician? Is there a role there? Well, many of them can help with, uh, you know, pain management. Okay. And also possibly, you know, you know, psychological support as well, you mm -hmm. know, with the prescribing antidepressants, et cetera. So right. many of them do that as well. Mm -hmm. It can also work in conjunction with the, the pain specialist. Some pain specialists uh, act just as cons consultants, mm -hmm. and they, they want the primary care physician to be the prescriber for the medication. Right. All right, great. All right. All right.